All right, let's go ahead and take a look at your homework. Page 171, you did questions 19, 20, 23, and then problem number 11 as well. All right. Good. Uh, let's take a look at number 19. It says, how is the IMA of a pulley, and it really means a block and tackle, but how is the IMA of a pulley or a block and tackle determined? Audrey? Uh, the IMA of a pulley is determined by the number of strands lifting the load and by reversing the direction. You were right when you said the number of strands lifting the load. I'm not sure what you meant by reversing the direction. That's what the uh, that's what a downward pulley would uh, a free strand would do is reverse direction. But anyway, uh, yeah, number of strands that lift the load. Number twenty. What is the IMA of a wheel and axle and identify each variable? Michael? So the IMA of the wheel and axle is um, determined by dividing the input distance and output distance. The RI of the input distance is the radius and the output distance is the output of the radius. Okay, yeah, in a way. R sub I over R sub O is the simplified version of it, so you got that correct. Um, and you're not wrong on any of it, just kind of complicated it again. Uh, it's simple answers for a change. We're, we're used to weird, crazy, long answers. Uh, number 23, state two equations for efficiency. Give me the first equation, Audrey. Uh, eta equals um, work output over work input times 100%. And the other one, Michael, is actually one that I showed a, a day or two ago. Eta equals AMA over IMA times 100%. Excellent. Let's go and review some things we talked about before we look at the homework problem. Talking about simple machines. Audrey, it would be Kendall's turn, but she's not here. So, Audrey, on Kendall's behalf, what are the six simple machines? Lever, wedge, pulley, wheel and axle, um, uh, incline plank, and did I say wedge? You did. Um, you said lever, wedge, wheel and axle, pulley, Inclined plane. Oh, come on, Kendall, you can do this. Okay, Michael, help Kendall. Screw. Screw. All right, so, so far, Audrey only got five out of six. Kendall only got five out of six. But Michael has gotten six out of six when he had his turn. So good job, Michael. <laughs> anyway, we said for these machines, the purpose of a machine is to do what, Audrey? Make life easier. Specifically by making work easier, good. And um, the way in which you gain an advantage from using the machine is if the machine is able to do what? How does it make work easier? Yeah, multiply work. Well, it doesn't multiply work, it multiplies force, right? And we call this ability of the machine to multiply force. Um, okay, no. Mm -hmm. mechanical. mechanical advantage, the ability of the machine to multiply force and we have two types of mechanical advantage. Of course, Michael, on one hand, we would have um, the uh, actual, mechanical actual mechanical advantage, which is actually how much the machine multiplies force, right? So we said in general class, to find AMA, we simply take the ratio. Output force over input force, because you want more output than you put in, right? Otherwise, that's a sad day. But there's the other type of mechanical advantage, Audrey, which is what you should get theoretically. We call it the IMA, IMA which stands for um, ideal. ideal mechanical advantage. And that's not a ratio of forces. That's a ratio class of distances, the other aspect of work. And IMA class is going to be D sub I over D sub O. Because remember, you don't get something for nothing. If you're getting out more force, you're having to put in more distance. The more distance you put in, the greater, theoretically, your force should be multiplied then. And so D sub I over D sub O. And of course, we said for different simple machines, we'll define the AMA and IMA in different ways. We talked about the lever and said basically, what is a lever? It could be a lot of different physical objects, but in general, levers are and and they as you pivot them there we go long and flexible object that pivots uh, used to often displace something um, we said the pivot point of the lever class fulcrum and the object that's intended to be moved is the load what was the law of levers equation Audrey There we 
we go. And uh, we said for a lever, AMA and IMA will end up being equal to each other because we have to assume it's ideal. We have to assume there's no flexion or bend and there's no friction at the pivot point, right? If it's rusted at the pivot, there will be friction. If it bends at all, and technically it'll be a minutia of bending, then AMA and IMA wouldn't be equal, then we wouldn't be able to figure out the math. So for our purposes, we kind of create the perfect rule, which isn't foreign to us. We've done that a number of times in other ways. Uh, we talked about uh, different classes of levers. And uh, give me one of the classes of levers with an example and then the description. So class, example, description. And we'll start with Kendall. Kendall, in your best Audrey voice. Um, uh, class one. Okay, class one lever, good. Mm -hmm. I'm looking down at Kendall. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Kendall. We love you, Kendall. We miss you. Well, I wasn't even going to get into that necessarily, but it could multiply either force or speed depending on. But uh, what's an example of a class one lever that I gave? A seesaw is a good, oh, sorry, sorry. That's a good example, a seesaw, very good. And uh, so what's the key to make something being a class one lever, Kendall? The fulcrum's in the middle. Very good, fulcrum's in the middle. Great job. You've been paying attention to these videos you've been watching. Proud of you, Kendall. All right, we are praying for you, by the way, and your brother, your whole family. Um, let's see, uh, another class of lever, uh, Michael. Class three. Class three, okay, tell me about class three. Yeah. Um, good example? Baseball bat. Baseball bat. And the key to the being something being a class three lever. The or input force. The input force or the effort has to be in the middle between, not necessarily center middle, but in between the output and the fulcrum. And then Audrey, your turn. You get the last class of levers. Um, that class two. Class two, okay, and a good example would be? Um, wheelbarrow. And what makes something a class two lever is that the? The output force is in the middle. Yeah, the output force or the load is in the middle. From there we moved on to the, uh, the ramp, which is the more practical term for class N. Inclined plane. inclined plane, there we go, an inclined plane. And we said for an inclined plane, the uh, input force is usually called the applied force, right? It's usually the name for it. So we could say that the AMA of an inclined plane will have applied force as the input. How do we calculate applied force? Just picture the free body diagram. What would give us the applied force, anyone? The weight. The weight. Uh, force. In the X, the weight in the X, okay? So whatever the weight in the X is, you have to apply force to match that. And oftentimes, um, we have to also match friction force. Yeah, I guess theoretically, if there were no friction. But yeah, the applied force is going to counter those two, remember. What would be the output force of a ramp? What is the ramp or the inclined plane designed to do, class? Lift. To lift while you push. So what is the output force of a ramp? Distance. The output force of a ramp. If it's lifting, that counters the weight. The output force is simply going to be the same as the weight of the object. So it's not a different equation. It's just a way to kind of redefine the uh, AMA. And then we said for the, uh, for the IMA of a ramp, we said, well, IMA is defined as input distance over output distance. But on a ramp, what distance do you put in? The length of the ramp. What distance does the ramp put out? The change in the height, however high it lifts the object. And we said that length and height are related to the angle of elevation of that ramp uh, by what trig function? The sine, but more specifically, the reciprocal of the sine. And either of those could be used to find the IMA of the ramp. From there, we talked about uh, the wedge. And I said, really, truly, what is a wedge? Uh, Audrey? Okay, good. It splits or cuts mm -hmm. an object. And how did I define it? That's its purpose is to split or cut, but I defined it as... Two inclined planes back-to-back. -back. Good. Two inclined planes back-to-back, -back, so we have a point that's formed. And um, we said the AMA is really... There's no way to really calculate it. There's going to be so much friction involved. Um, the IMA we could find, though... What distance do you put in when you use a knife or an axe? The distance that the machine puts in is the depth of the blade. Right? However deep that blade is is how much distance it will put in. 
What distance does it put out as it cuts or splits? The width of the blade. So if we took the depth of the blade from sharp end to back end, or if it's double-edged, sharp end, sharp end, um, but thinking of a typical knife, the sharp point to the back flat end of the knife, that depth of the blade divided by the thickness at the thickest point. And uh, so we said that the greater power of a wedge is there when the blade is deeper and thinner. The deeper the blade and thinner the blade, the more easy it is to cut or split. Uh, for instance, um, you know what a normal paper cutter is, right? There's a pivoting hinge point here. In fact, it's a technically a lever. And you apply force here. There's the pivot point. It's a class two lever because the load is cutting the paper. Usually you're cutting just a couple sheets of paper. But um, if we do spirit chains this year, I don't remember if we did last year or not. I have a feeling we skipped it last year, but I can't remember. But uh, you put paper on there. If you put too much paper, it really takes some effort to cut through that paper. Well, there's a paper cutter in the office now, over at the office complex, that is just a straight down guillotine blade. And uh, as, you bring it, as you bring a hinge down, it pushes the guillotine blade down. And it just slices right through hundreds of sheets of paper like nothing. It's very thin and it's very deep. And so we get a great deal of mechanical advantage in using that blade. So anyway, just kind of an interesting little thought. I hadn't thought about mentioning the, that paper cutter to you, but uh, anyway, so if you wanted to, you know, we were invited on Wednesday night, stop by the office complex, see the Christmas tree, and ask Miss Henderson, can I see the paper cutter? Anyway, and it really ask if you could see the replacement blade, so you could see how deep it is. Anyway, um, I don't know that she wants you doing that, but whatever, I, you know. Uh, if you do, just don't name my name. Uh, screw, what is a screw? Uh, how do we define that, Michael? Good, an inclined plane wrapped around a rod. So you've got a cylindrical shape of some kind with an inclined plane. Or, I mean, the, the example over there on that poster is a light bulb. Well, in that case, it's not an inclined plane, it's an inclined groove, which is, you know, whatever. But an inclined plane wrapped around the rod. And the, the purpose of the screw, then, is as you turn it, it will go up or down, right? As you turn the light bulb, for instance, it goes up into the light socket. You're turning, it's going up or down. I said, really, as far as a machine goes, that's not a great example, but we could think of maybe a screw jack, right? Where as you turn, it goes up or down and it's able to lift a load. Well, we said for the AMA, it's the output force, which is usually the weight of the object that's being lifted over the input force, which is the force you have to apply. Really straightforward. We said for the IMA, as you're turning the jack handle, you're making what shape class? Regardless of which direction the jack handle works. You're making a circle, and the distance you put in will be the distance around the circle or the circumference. So we said for a screw, the IMA is going to take the input distance, which is the circumference of a circle, 2 pi r, where r just indicates the radius of your circle or the length of the handle. And then what about the output distance? You turn the handle, and it raises it, and for every one turn you make, the screw rises, or if you're going backwards, lowers one distance between the ridges. What do we call the distance between the ridges of a screw? Pitch. The pitch. And so we'll say that 2 pi r over p is our equation for the IMA. And we were using that equation in our problem last night, page 171, problem 11. Read the problem for us if you would, Kendall, but this time, if you can make your voice do it, I want you to imitate Michael's voice. Go ahead, Kendall, problem 11. A screw jack has a handle of radius 1 meter and a thread pitch of 6.4 millimeters. Calculate the IMA of the jack. Hey, if you're watching on YouTube, you have to be impressed. That sounded just like Michael. She is great at impersonations. That was fantastic. Her Audrey voice earlier sounded a lot like Audrey, too. She can even throw her voice, make it sound like it's coming from other parts of the room. I'll tell you the things I do to entertain myself. <laughs> I guess I just really miss having Kendall right here. So, anyway. All right, um, so uh, I am able to jack. So all we have to do is plug in the numbers, right? We've got 2 times pi times, and it says the hand, this is a really big handle. The radius, the handle is one meter. So I mean, a meter stick long handle. Now, this is really impractical if we're thinking of like the screw jack for our car, because if you're trying to, jack, you don't have a meter to turn around, okay? So it's got to be some kind of horizontal handle. This is a massive handle on the screw jack. Oh, by the way, maybe go back in your minds. We just had Thanksgiving. Remember the story of the Mayflowers that was coming over, and there was a printing press screw mechanism that was on board, 
And uh, there was the controversy over, hey, this boat is being tossed. We need to toss this thing overboard. It's weighing down the ship. But before they threw it overboard, one of the main beams cracked, and they had to jack it up, and they used the printing press screw and turned it around around. This might have had a handle about that size for a screw that large. They were actually able to put that screw in place to jack up the deck of the Mayflower to get it across the Atlantic Ocean. Anyway, um, what's the pitch of this apparently massive screw? 6.4 millimeters, but there we've got a problem, right? We can't have both. So uh, 6.4 millimeters would be 0 0.0064 meters. So again, you know, centimeters here, this is about half a centimeter. It's still a pretty good thread pitch, but I mean, we're talking about what is apparently a massive screw. All right, and so uh, we plug in the numbers. And Two times pi times one uh, divided by uh, 0 0.0064. And this is a massive IMA class. 981.7, blah, blah, blah. Round it off to sig figs. It is 980. What units do we use for IMA and AMA for that matter, class? No. Nothing. Just 980. Meaning, as you apply, say, 10 pounds of force, it can apply a pushing force of 9,800 pounds, or whatever the units happen to be that we would use for our force. Now, in reality, is that how much force it will put out? No, because of friction. friction. But as we said yesterday, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. Friction's a very good thing, okay? You're willing to sacrifice uh, some IMA for the sake of the screw actually staying where you've got it. All right, questions on this? All right, next thing in your notes, and this is something that I like to demonstrate, but we're gonna have to save it for the lab day after the test, and that is the pulley, the pulley. Next section in your notes. The pulley is a circular lever. You can think of it as a circular lever designed to redirect force. A pulley can be thought of as a circular lever used to redirect force. Think about it, it'd be a class one lever with equal lever arms as the circle turns. You'd use a cable, of course, over the pulley as you pull on one side, you're applying force on one side of the lever. It lifts up on the other side. But because the lever arms are equal to each other, it's the same force on both sides, isn't it? For instance, if we had a, a really strong hook in the ceiling, not anchored to one of these stupid tiles, but actually anchored to one of the beams above it, and uh, I were to have a box on the floor and I hooked the cable over it, whatever it weighs, I would have to pull down with that much force. So if it's a 50 pound box, I've got to pull down with 50 pounds of force. And then the box goes up because 50 pounds down pulls 50 pounds downward, but as it goes over the cable, that's 50 pounds of tension upward, which counters the 50 pounds of weight, correct? All it does is redirect force, but that's helpful because let's be honest, we lifted boxing, just imagine. <laughs> Stop thinking of that until you graduate. Anyway, bending down, lifting with your knees, not with your back and Carrying it that way, wouldn't it be easier just to pull down? Because I've got 180 pounds right here I can put into it. I can pull down 150 pounds way easier than I can lift 50 pounds, right? So redirecting force is valuable to me. But a pulley can do more than simply redirect force if I change the arrangement a little bit. For instance, I could use multiple pulleys together. And if I do, then I would have something called a block and tackle. Block and tackle is the next thing. And uh, we'll do some designs of block and tackle uh, in our lab day that are really neat to see. If you've ever used workout equipment, uh, as in not just like raw barbell or dumbbell rather, no, barbell with weights on the side, but like equipment where there's pulleys and stuff, you've seen block and tackle. Now in those cases, they purposely have block and tackle to increase friction, and that is helping to uh, give you a better workout. But if we're ignoring friction, which we so often do, a block and tackle, here's your definition, is multiple pulleys used in combination. Multiple pulleys used in combination. And this is really where the pulley starts to uh, become a true machine in the sense of, I guess, yeah, by redirecting your force, you've made work easier. So it's a machine already, but it's really gonna be able to multiply your force when you use the pulleys in combination together. Picture this for a moment. There's two types of pulleys. If you look at page uh, 168, yeah, let's go with that one. Page 168, the first picture that you see, example A, is that uh, example of a fixed pulley. The example that I gave a moment ago about the pulley that is attached to the ceiling. 
But imagine instead of having the pulley attached to the ceiling, imagine I had just an anchor attached to the ceiling and the rope came down. Imagine that as the rope comes down, I attach the pulley not to the ceiling, but to the box on the floor. And I pull, pull the, uh, the rope underneath, and then I just lift on the rope. Well, as I'm lifting on the rope, that's going to lift the pulley, which is going to lift the box that it's attached to. But when I pull one foot worth of rope up, that pulls six inches of rope worth from each side of the pulley, which means it only actually rises six inches. I've now put in more distance than the pulley did. And by putting in, because I erased it, by putting in more distance, it's going to put out more force. So if it's a 50 pound box, I only have to pull with 25 pounds of force. Now, I will admit, the physics teacher in me has thought about the food drive. I'm like, we do this every year. Every year, we're hauling boxes. I'm like, you know what would be good is if we could like hook up a pulley system in the stairwell. Just lower the boxes down that way. It'd be easier. And uh, But go to all the work to rig up the pulley system. Nah. Uh, so anyway, but a, a movable pulley will actually multiply force by causing you, costing you distance. Now, imagine you're at a warehouse or something. And you know those loading docks at the edge of the warehouse where the trucks back up? Well, imagine out at the end of the overhang where the truck backs into, you've got the anchorage attached there. And you're standing there, the box is on the floor, and now as you pull, it's going to rise, but it may also start to swing outward toward where you are as well. So you can use it in a swing method there as well, or somebody can come along and push it along the rope as well. And all they're doing is pushing relatively frictionless. You're doing the lifting, but you're lifting half as much. Another example could be if you used both the wheel at the top and the wheel at the bottom. So imagine here we've got a pulley. So there's your pulley wheel attached to the box, and you've got a pulley wheel here. You're standing here. Now you've got three legs somehow. Okay, you're standing here, and um, there's an anchorage with the cable coming down, going under the wheel. But instead of the pulley going down, let's redirect this wheel. Instead of the pulley just going straight up to you, it comes down like that. Well, now this one is maximizing your force like we talked about. This one's redirecting the force. So now I get to both pull down and I get to get the benefit. So I'm, I'm getting the pull down effect, which is easier than pull, pulling up. And I get the effect of, as I'm pulling, it's going to redirect. It's going to uh, max, double my force coming up. Well, you could do even better if, as you see in the next example, you use a double wheel pulley. So we use a second wheel attached to both of them. So as the wheel comes up, now again, here they'd have to really be stacked on top of each other. The strain comes up over the wheel, under this wheel, and over this wheel, and down. And now I'm able to pull on this side as it lifts it up. And again, the cables are going to cross over each other a little bit. But now what I'm doing is, as I pull, I pull, say, one foot. Well, it pulls a little bit on this one, a little bit on this one. These two are just redirecting force. Well, now I've now doubled and doubled again my force. I've now quadrupled it, okay? So there's different ways in which you can make it work. So ultimately, as far as AMA for a block and tackle, it's still gonna be how much force do I have to put out versus how much force does uh, the thing lift for me, right? So still output over input, no big deal there. But the net result is every time you use a movable pulley, you're increasing your force. The use of the, of the movable pulley increases force. Well, if you look at the different pictures, here's what it boils down to, as, as Audrey answered in the homework, is you can count how many strands of pulley there are, how many strands are lifting the load. So if you look at the first example with a single fixed pulley, there's two strands. There's the downward strand that it shows with the F sub I, and there's the upward strand with the F sub O. The one strand is down. It's not lifting. The F sub O strand is lifting. There's one strand that lifts. But look at the next example. You notice there's two strands as you go across, and both strands are now working to lift. That's why you get an IMA of two, which means in theory, you double your output force if there were no friction at the hub of the wheel. Go to letter C. If you count right across the middle, you see a free strand going down, and you see one, two, three, four strands across toward the middle. All four strands are lifting. You get an IMA of four. Meaning, if it were a perfect world with no friction, as you pull down with 100 pounds of force, you can lift 400 pounds. Look at the next example. If you rigged it so that the free strand is going up, 
Now you still have those same four strands across, right? But since the free strand is also lifting, that gives you a fifth strand that lifts that gives you an IMA of five. Meaning again, it could quintuple, I think that's the right word, your input force. The more strands you use, the more it can do. Now, picture the boom of a crane, right? You've seen, you've seen the cranes lifting loads. There's a gazillion different pulley wheels at the top, and then at the hook, there's a bazillion different pulley wheels as well. And they've got the strands that run and loop around there. So the crane motor only has to exert so much force, and the pulleys multiply that force. Now, the actual crane is still being subjected to however much that thing weighs. So you have to use all the counterbalancing weight at the back of the crane, but that's how the cranes are able to lift tons and tons of weight is by the motor not having to lift tons of weight, right? In fact, we use the example of the, do uh, you remember the, um, uh, the elevator example where it talked about power, right? How much motor does the power have to put out? In reality, it's going to use a system of block and tackle that's going to multiply the force. The motor doesn't have to put out that much force. They don't need a that powerful a motor. It's going to multiply force through the use of a block and tackle. And again, we'll get to actually see this in the lab. We just had to cut it out. Okay, so levers, uh, lever, incline plane, pulley, wheel and axle, which we're getting to. A lot of those things we're going to have to wait till the lab day to do. For now, you're just going to have to trust me that it's true. And then we can demonstrate that it's true later, and it'll be cool. So look at example 11.7. Look at example 11.7. And uh, read the example, if you would, for us, uh, Michael. The block and tackle shown in figure 11.16 is being used to raise a, raise a load of 510 pounds. A, what is the IMA of the block and tackle? If the input force is 120 pounds, what is the AMA? If the load is raised to four feet, through what distance will input force be exerted? All right, so uh, the first thing it asks is what's the IMA? So what we need to do is look at the picture and see how many strands of cable or rope do we see? Call it when you've counted them. I see technically seven strands, but the free strand is that down strand that's off to the side, right? Right, so if you're counting across one, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's that seventh strand off to the side, but is the seventh strand lifting class? No. no, it's going downward, meaning that final strand is simply a redirection, right? So if there's six strands that are lifting the load, what's the IMA? Six. six. IMA for this particular block and tackle arrangement would be six. All right? Next question. If you put in a force of 120 pounds and you're able to lift or raise the load of 510 pounds, excuse me, what's the AMA? Well, how do I find AMA class? Force output force input. Output force over input force, right? So we take the output, which was the... 510, that's the weight, over the input, 120, and we divide 510 by 120, we get 4.25. So ideal mechanical advantage, 6, that's perfect world, no friction anywhere, and the actual mechanical advantage, 4.25. Now, by the way, it could be friction, it could also be a little bit of um, uh, elongation in the cable, right? The cable could be stretching just a little bit as well, and that would lose you a little bit of benefit. So, uh, but probably primarily friction here. So not as, as great as the IMA, but not bad, right? Pretty close. The last question says, if the load is raised four feet, meaning that crate, that box, gets four feet off the ground, how much rope have you had to pull? Remember, which of these two values is a ratio of distance? IMA. IMA is a ratio of input distance to output distance. In theory, then, that means that's how much force it would multiply. But in reality, it's that's how much more distance you put in. So if it raises the load four feet, how much cable am I pulling? 24 feet of cable or rope. 24 feet pulling, and it goes up four feet but I didn't have to lift 510 pounds, which is really good. And I was redirecting downward. I didn't have to lift 120, did I? I pulled down, I can do 120 down. <laughs> Just hang on the rope, okay? Actually, Audrey would have to hang on the rope. I don't quite have to hang on the rope, right? Uh, but I can do 120 down easily. Lifting 510, you see me, ain't happening, okay? But I can do it as long as I'm willing to pull 24 feet worth of rope to get it up there. 
Any questions on that? Interesting problem, by the way, or it was, it was a question, to, really it was a problem, but it was interesting on page 171. I think we can, I think we can take just a moment to go here. Uh, question 21 says, design a block and tackle with an IMA of seven. Now, what we saw on the previous page there was an IMA of six. What would give you the IMA of seven? If that seventh free strain was going up instead of down. Now, notice the design here. Look really closely at the design. Where does the, um, you see the free strand, if you track the loops, where does the loop, where does the cable end? Where is the end of the cable? Where does it stop? On the top set, it's anchored to the very bottom of that stack of three pulley wheels. Do you see it? So imagine for a moment, we still use three pulley wheels at the top. We still use three pulley wheels at the bottom. But instead of having the anchorage anchor here, or if it's a set of pulley wheels with an anchorage here, instead of anchoring here, we instead anchor it here. This is where the pulley starts. And then it loops around one wheel, around the next wheel, around the next wheel, and then the free end lifts up. Now we've got the same six strands at the middle, but the free strand is now lifting up as well. This would be your IMA of seven. Okay. So um, anyway, questions on that? I didn't give you that problem to try to figure out through your homework reading, but thought we'd at least take the moment to discuss it. Questions on that? And again, we'll do some really creative block and tackle uh, combinations in our lab coming up. You can tell I'm excited about this. I like playing. It's basically like playing with toys. I love playing with toys. Um, I'm a physics teacher. All right. Um, all right. Next simple machine. Last simple machine that we will talk about, the wheel and axle. Wheel and axle. Now, you guys are familiar enough with, like, you know, a car... And so you know what an axle is, right? It's uh, two wheels that are uh, on the same uh, uh, rod type thingy, we call it an axle, and they turn together, right? But that's not really a machine. It's useful, right? I mean, it'd be really sad to have a car without it. It's useful, but it isn't really a machine in that it doesn't multiply force. It just allows things to roll. For it to multiply force or multiply speed, what the wheel and axle's got to have are differing sizes of wheels. That's where it's going to start to multiply force. Think about it. If you have a wheel and it's attached to another wheel and they're the same size, as you turn, it turns the exact same everything with you. Nothing's multiplied. But imagine a really big wheel and you turn it a big distance. If it were attached to a smaller wheel, the smaller wheel would still only make one turn with it, wouldn't it? But since it's a smaller wheel, it's a smaller distance. And if it's a smaller distance, since you're putting in more distance, it can put out more force. Force and displacement have to be, have to be consistent, right, if work is accomplished. You're not creating work, so if you're willing to put in more distance, it's able to put out more force. For an example, um, I haven't given you your definition yet, but think about a well. You know, the old style wells that you read about in fairy tale books, right? The little stone wall, deep hole in the ground. There's usually a little roof over it to keep rainwater and contaminants from getting in, however effective that was. And then uh, there was a little wooden rod with a handle, crank handle on it, and then the rope just kind of coiled around it, and there was a bucket. And uh, so uh, you uh, let the bucket down, or really, I guess you just drop the bucket, it just kind of goes down, the handle spins for a little bit, and it's splunk. You wait, whoop, 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 whoop. you wait for the bucket to fill up. Now, five-gallon paint bucket, you've ever picked up one of those filled with water? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's heavy. A gallon weighs eight pounds. So that's a 40-pound bucket. Lifting 40-pound bucket is going to be bad for your back. But all you've got to do is turn the crank. Now, picture this now. Let's say the handle comes out about this far, and you're turning the handle. What's the wheel that's lifting the bucket? It's just however thick the dowel is plus whatever width of rope happens to be connected, right? You're turning a big distance and it's just turning a little bit. And little by little the bucket comes up. But because you're putting in so much distance, bucket comes up, it's not actually that heavy. 
to get it to the top. Now, you still have to get the bucket off or dump the bucket, okay? But as far as lifting it up from the bottom of the well, it wasn't that bad because you multiply force by putting in a greater distance. Let me go and give you your definition here before I get any further. Um, wheel and axle. Two wheels of differing sizes, two wheels of differing sizes, two wheels of differing sizes that are connected. And oftentimes this will be in the case we just mentioned or are mounted on the same axle. Two wheels of differing sizes that are connected or mounted on the same axle. And we understand that's not the only way wheels can connect, right? Wheels don't have to be on the same axle to connect. Right? You know, gears, right? Gears that interlock, those can be different, often differing sizes of wheels as well. And as one turns, and you got, any of you ever played with little gear toys when you were little? Somebody gave us some suction cup gears, and we suction cupped them in the front of the dishwasher so the kids could play. You could rig a whole little thing like you turn this wheel, and it turns all the wheels. The easiest wheel to turn is the biggest. As you turn the biggest wheel, it turns the smaller wheels with relative ease. If you try to turn the small wheel, though, it's harder. You have to put in more force to turn the little wheel, but it turns the big wheel. Think about this on a bicycle, right? You're pedaling. Now, you're making a decent-sized circle with your feet, but the, hopefully you're on big kid bikes now. The wheels on the bike are bigger than that, correct? Now, they're not directly connected. They're connected through a chain, right? And the chain goes around from your gear to a gear that's attached to the bicycle. But if you've got you know, a fancy bike, you might have noticed on the back wheel there are multiple gears. Have you noticed that? And what the chain will do is it'll slip to or go to the proper gear depending on the speed setting that you put. Speed bike, you've driven speed bikes, so you know what I'm talking about. You change the gears. Now, if you notice that when you go to the higher speed, it's harder to push the pedals. And what you're going to notice is that the chain is now going to the smallest gear. There's also a tension gear as well to make sure it doesn't just slip and fall off. But it goes down to the smallest gear. So you're now turning a big circle. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, you're turning a big circle, and it's turning... The small wheel, hold on, I'm trying to come yeah, positive. It turns the big circle, which turns the small circle. Right, you're turning a big circle, but it's turning the small circle, which in turn turns the big wheel, right? So as it turns that little gear, that's turning the whole bicycle wheel. So you essentially are turning the smallest wheel. You're putting in much less distance, which means you have to put out more force. But the effect is it multiplies your speed, right? You turn one turn of the pedals, the gears are able to turn the back wheel by turning a little here, able to turn it multiple times, right? And so that's the net effect, and that's the reason why that works. So a couple rules for you to write down. If you turn the small wheel, it will multiply speed. If your force is directed to the small wheel, which again, in the case of the speed bike, on the higher speed setting, it's the smallest gear on the back wheel. If you turn the smaller wheel, it will multiply your speed. Another good example of this would be uh, in the, underneath a car, we have what's called a drivetrain, right? The engine makes revolutions, which we'll get to in chapter 13. The engine makes revolutions, which drives the drive shaft, which goes under the car. The drive shaft has at the end a gear that is connected to the drive wheels, which on most vehicles, I think now are actually front wheel drive, it used to be rear wheel drive, front wheel drive. So it, it turns the, the drive shaft, which has a little pinion gear. And you've got the larger drive gear, the, the ring gear, and that one is much larger. And so it's able to spin the wheels very quickly. The engine doesn't have to turn as fast as the wheels are going. And so um, that multiplies speed. However, if you turn the larger wheel, if you turn the larger wheel, which in turn turns the smaller wheel, you'll multiply force. And that's the example of the well. If you turn the larger wheel, you'll multiply force. So if your force goes in, it's input to the larger, it multiplies your force on the smaller. If you turn the smaller, you multiply speed on the larger. It just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Now, as far as IMA, or as far as AMA, again, it's how much force do you get out versus how much force do you put in. As far as the IMA, you're turning wheels, right? What shape is being made in both cases? A circle, right? So the input distance is simply the input circumference. And the output distance is simply the output circumference. But thoughts on how we could simplify this? Cancel the two pies. 
So practically speaking, then, the same ratio, the same R sub I over R sub O that we saw with levers is also true for the wheel and axle. The input radius, that is the, the radius of the wheel that you are turning, over the radius of the wheel that is being turned. And there's your IMA of the wheel and axle. Look at the example problem on page 11.8. And again, it mentions even in the book, we're going to get to torque in chapter 13. There's a lot to do with torque with the wheel and axle, but we're going to save that for chapter 13. Uh, example 11.8, read the problem for us, Audrey. A uh, hand winch has a crank 75 centimeters long and winds a cable on the ground that is 20 centimeters in diameter. Neglecting friction, what input force is required to pull a load of 2.2 P3 newtons with this winch? All right, so we've got this uh, we've got this drum, if you will, the cylinder, and the cable just wraps around it. Okay, we are we have this long hand crank, and we're turning the hand crank. So are we turning the big circle, or are we turning the small circle? We're turning the big one, which turns the small one, right? So we're putting in our force on the bigger one, and it says the handle is seventy-five centimeters. Well, they give us the drum in centimeters also, so I don't have to change this to meters. I can say that the input radius is 75 centimeters. Easy enough? The output radius, well, it told me what about this drum? It's 20 centimeters. 20 centimeters across. So what's the radius of the drum? 10. 10 centimeters. So that's the radius that is being put out as the smaller, as the drum turns with the hand crank, Cancel the centimeters. What's the IMA of this wheel and axle? 7.5. 7 which means, in theory, whatever force I put in will be multiplied by 7.5. In theory. Well, they kind of lend themselves to theory because notice it says ignore friction. Right? So if we're ignoring friction, and I guess technically ignoring some stretching in the cable that as it winds around, then we will multiply our force by 7.5, won't we? How much force are we needing to lift it? They don't tell me how much force we apply. Think about it. If I said I apply 100 pounds of force times 7.5, it puts out 750. What if I put it the other way? I need to lift this much force. What would I do to determine force that's needed? Divide the 7.5, right? If you know the force that's being applied, it multiplies it by 7.5. If you know the force that is needed to be lifted, you divide by 7.5. And they tell us that the object that is being lifted, this load, is 2,200 newtons. I need to lift 2,200 newtons. How much force do I need to apply? Well, just divide by 7.5. And uh, how much force do I need to apply? And a two sig fix, I hope. Nope, three sig fix. So. Which that's about 80-ish pounds of force. That's not that much. It's a fair bit still, but not that much. Certainly not, um, you know, 500 pounds. All right, questions on this? You good, Audrey? Okay, so you looked like you were still calculating some things. In. All right, uh, turn over to pay, actually, next thing in your notes, excuse me, next thing in your notes, and you see it right there on page 169, and we talked about it briefly the other day, this term efficiency. Efficiency. Anytime you lose energy to external factors, and again, I'm getting into chapter 12 stuff here, so I don't want to get too deep into it, but anytime you lose energy through friction, flexion, stretching, external forces that don't contribute to the work being done, you lose work, meaning you are doing work and getting nothing out of the machine in return. The efficiency of the machine is how effectively does it maintain your work? Here's the literal definition then. To figure out how efficiently it maintains your work, we could take how much work you put in and how much work it puts out. Now, we will never put out more than you can put in. The goal is to not lose too much. So if we take how much work you get out compared to as a fraction of the work you put in, which will always be the larger value, that fraction gives us an idea of what percentage of work. We just have to make it a percent. So we'll take efficiency, and it's the ratio of output work to input work expressed as a percent. Am I slapping a percent sign on there? Other way. By slapping a percent sign on there, we turn whatever that decimal or fraction value would have been into a percent. So the equation is the definition. The ratio of output work to input work expressed as a percent. 
the ratio of output work to input work expressed as a percent. So you simply determine how much work did I do, how much work did the machine do. And once you've determined that, change it to a percentage, and you have no, no, no more than 100% efficiency. That's the best you can have. Uh, but we saw the other day we had that ramp problem, and the efficiency came out to 29% efficiency. There was a lot of friction. Uh, a wedge is going to have uh, lower efficiency because there's a great deal of friction, a lot of energy loss. Now think about this, though. What is output work? Well, output work would be force times displacement of output. Input would be force times displacement of input. And if I were to take this fraction times this fraction, that would be the same as dividing by the reciprocal. Right? We know division is multiplying by a reciprocal. Multiplication could be dividing by a reciprocal. So we could say it's force over force, output over input, over, if we flipped it, d sub i over d sub o. Right? Instead, if you multiply by the reciprocal, it would be back again. Well, what is output force over input force? That's A of A. What's input distance over output distance? I of A. So efficiency could also be found by taking AMA, the real mechanical advantage, divided by the ideal mechanical advantage based on the design, and making that a percent. They're going to be the same answer. But since we find AMA and IMA so often, it's often going to be easier for us to find efficiency by making a ratio of the mechanical advantages to each other rather than actually the work to each other. Look at the example problem on page 170. Look at page 170, the example problem. And we've got this uh, uh, example. An automobile weighs 350 pounds, 3,500 pounds, has a 106 horsepower engine. Uh, actually, you know what? You're not going to see anything quite like that for sake of time because we're crunched for time. I've got to finish the chapter in two minutes. Move on. Let's go to number 12. Sorry. Just looked at the time and realized we got to move. Uh, number 12. Oh, yeah. We need to look at this anyway because it's got wheel and axle in it. Uh, wheel and axle have diameters of half a meter and 3.8 centimeters, respectively. Force of tw tw blah, 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 280 newtons is necessary to raise a load of 2,400 newtons. Find the IMA, the AMA, and the efficiency. All right, ask for IMA first of all. How do I find the IMA of a wheel and axle? Um, radius and input radius over output radius, right? Um, and uh, let's see. I'm only putting in 280 newtons to get out 2400 newtons. So I'm multiplying force. So which wheel am I turning? I'm turning the big wheel. Which is the big wheel? The half meter wheel, right? Half meter diameter. Wait a second, diameter? Well, think about it. If you have two diameters, diameters are simply double radii anyway, right? So you could put diameters instead of radii. Save ourselves the work. Or if you want to say 20.25 meters, you could do that. I'm just going to leave it as the diameter. I'm going to say half a meter. Stay with me. Half a meter for the small for the larger wheel. Smaller wheel, what's its diameter? Good. 0 0.038 meters. We had to change those centimeters to meters. So when you divide 0 0.5 by 0 0.038, what do we get for the ideal mechanical advantage? 13.15. Blah blah blah. Put that in the memory of your calculator. The next question says to find the AMA of the wheel and axle. Well, how do I find AMA? Uh, output force over input force. How much force does it put out? Um, it puts out, it lifts a load of 2,400 newtons. I only put in a force of 280 newtons. I'm going to knock off the zeros and the newtons and do 240 divided by 28. What's the actual mechanical advantage? 8.57. All right, blah, blah, blah. Now, keep that on your calculator. You don't, you don't have to put it in the memory. The next thing says find the efficiency. And since I already have the mechanical advantages, all I need to take is the AMA on the calculator divided by the IMA, which is in the memory. And when you do, it'll give you a decimal. What is your decimal? 0.651. 4, blah, 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 right? Now, what does 100% literally mean? One. 
If you multiply by one, nothing changes. The point of this is to say, move the decimal, make it a percent. So if I move the decimal two places or multiply by 100, it'll get 65.14, blah, 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 and it will put the percent as my unit. That's what the times 100% means. Practically, just make it a percent. And uh, rounding off to um, two sig figs, we'll say it's about 65% efficiency. I and A, we'd round to 13. A and A, we'd round to 8.6 and it's about 65% efficient as a wheel and axle. Very quickly, one last thing, I know we're, we're pushing time here. Number 13, um, force of 55 newtons exerted through 0.35 meters, that's a distance on the input side of a lever, raises a load of 106 newtons, a distance of 0.16 meters. What's the efficiency of the lever? So think about it, you push down on one side, it lifts up a certain distance on the other side. A force times displacement class, we call that work. The other side also has a force times displacement. We call that work. What we want to do is compare the work that we put in. I put in 55 newtons times 0.35 meters. How much work am I putting in? 19.25 exactly? Yes. Uh, joules, excuse me, of course. Let's not do that again. All right, it lifts on the other side 106 newtons, but it lifts at only 0.16 meters. How much work is the lever putting out? 16.96. Ah, just spit out chalk. Uh, is it 16.96 joules? Was that exact? Yes. All right, so then we don't need memories then. All right, so the question is, did it put out as much work as I put in? No, not quite. And we said for our purposes, we assume no flexibility, no friction, none of that. But a more real life problem is it doesn't put out as much work. If we want the efficiency, the way it's defined class is output work to input work and then make it a percent. So take your output, which should still be on the calculator, divide by the 19.25. What decimal do you get? 0.881, blah, 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 move the decimal twice, we get 88. Point, is it three six things? Just 88.1 blah blah blah. So 88% efficiency. Questions on this? All right, homework for the weekend is to complete a handout. Obviously, it's in the description of the video for you there, Kendall. On Monday, lesson 78, we'll be taking a quiz over simple machines. So this handout is to get you ready for a quiz over simple machines. Monday and Tuesday, then, we'll be reviewing for your test, which will be on Wednesday. That's Lesson 80, and then we'll do our lab in Lesson 81. All right, have a wonderful rest of your day, and you are dismissed.